Good morning, afternoon, evening, as the case may be. I'm Bill Litton from SUNY Downstate, that's State University of New York in Brooklyn and Kings County Hospital. And I'm presenting today on can multi-scale computer modeling save the human genome project? And that's subtitled Climbing the Ohms of Schizophrenia. So the Human Genome Project perhaps is not really needs saving, but it in some sense did not live up to the hyperbole assigned to it. So the hope was you map the genome, you understand disease, and you cure disease. And this hope probably came from the known monogenic diseases, such as sickle cell, or cystic fibrosis, where you have a single gene altering a single protein, altering the entire phenome and the pathophysiology of the person causing disease. So it was hoped and perhaps even assumed that common diseases would also reflect clear genetics. Probably not monogenic, but maybe di or trigenic and would then give us a handle on how to treat these common diseases. And these common diseases would include diabetes, type 1 or type 2, or other subtypes that may exist that are not well-defined, uh, and hypertension, of which there are a number of subtypes, and schizophrenia, which also has multiple subtypes and enormous complexity. And we'll be talking today about schizophrenia. So schizophrenia, like many of these diseases, has no clear inheritance pattern. It has a combination of genetic underpinnings and of aspects of the disease that clearly have responded to nurture and not nature in terms of the person's experience. So what causes these common diseases? It's not purely inheritance, it's complex. It's multifactorial and it requires multifactorial approaches. So here on the bottom, just for entertainment value, we have the kind of genome that we need to look at, right? This is a uh, little snippet of a genome of something or someone or what is it? Of course, you cannot tell. It is a papaya, not even a person at all. So what we have set out to do in our lab is to climb the ohms and then link omics with clinical, clinical semiology, and that's the word like semiotics of signs, although in clinical talk that includes both symptoms, which are things reported by the patient, or in the case of schizophrenia, more often reported by the patient's family, and signs, and that's what you observe as a doctor when you see the patient. And we link all this with our multi-scale mod computer modeling, which uh, is abbreviated MSM, and which has been uh, strongly supported by Grace Pang and by the Interagency Modeling and Analysis Group Multi-Scale Modeling Initiative, uh, and a number of grant projects, some funded via BRAIN. Uh, so we want to understand how does the genome, which in this case is primarily the main chromosomal genome of the person, but in some cases it may include the microbiome, a tumorome, a virome, uh, the mitochondrial genome, etc. cetera, uh, it influence disease across levels of semiotics, semiology. Um, and we go via the, what's called the variome, which is mostly identified through looking at single nucleotide polymorphisms, little switches of individual um, nucleotides, A, T, G, or C, which are markers in the genome and are not necessarily, and often are not, directly inside a gene of interest, but are near enough that they co-localize with the gene of interest. Uh, there's also epigenome. We need to understand probably something about the proteome and certainly what's called the phenome. And in neuroscience, we also need to consider the connectome. And we also 
In neuroscience, when I consider behavior, when I consider cognition, when I consider these uh, things which don't have own names yet, although no doubt they soon will. So the clinical semiology of schizophrenia is complex. Molecular level known changes involve dopamine and glutamate neurotransmitters. There are dendritic changes, which include synaptic pruning. There are certainly changes during development, and in fact, the disease only manifests in typically late adolescence, early adulthood, and so the developmental anomalies are important. Uh, circuit anomalies, apoptosis, death of cells, which is natural because you do a lot of pruning in development, but here there's some pruning going awry probably. Uh, areas of the brain, the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus and the interlinks between them being particularly implicated, changes in the electroencephalogram, changes in gamma and theta, which uh, particularly gamma has been demonstrated clinically, and I say changes because sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down, will be focused on a case where in the animal model, which we have modeled, simulated, we see high gamma and low, higher gamma and lower theta, and then the remarkable and, and awful, frankly, thought disorder that patients have with this disease, which you would think would not be amenable to modeling simulation. Uh, it is not directly amenable, but we have a trick for doing that and looking at that using Shannon information theory. So we use multi-scale modeling. And uh, the scales here shown on the x-axis of uh, time, which go from millisecond uh, or sub-millisecond of molecular for, uh, deformation, such as the sodium channel change that leads to the spike or action potential, which takes a millisecond, up to years. If you talk about development, certainly not something we can currently simulate, except in a very uh, high level manner. Then here on the y-axis, we have space down to molecular, angstrom, nanometer level, and up to the entire brain systems, motor system, visual system, limbic system, all working together. Uh, and then above that, at, at a level that can be measured in time by things like reaction time, but cannot be assigned a spatial scale, cognition, behavior, information. So we want to link clinical semiology, multiple levels, the ohms, multiple level from genome to phenome, and our multi-scale modeling, where in this case, we're going to be focused on area CA3 of the hippocampus, and we're going to look at how interactions from the molecular level up to the circuit level change the way the circuit behaves in terms of dynamics and in terms of information flow. I also want to point out that the, what we've circled here, we have intersecting scales. So in some organ systems, you can say, okay, the cell does this, and now we'll simplify the cell and we'll embed it in a network of cells, such as the liver network of cells, which is very important in metabolism. Uh, but in the brain, I think the separation of scales is very difficult, in some cases impossible, because these cells are enormous and they go through multiple layers in the hippocampus. Layers include stratum aureum, stratum pyramidale, stratum radiatum. In the cortex, the layers are well known as layer one through layer six. But these cells are so big, they are sampling from different parts of the network. So the cells themselves behave uh, in ways that are determined by the network. And then, of course, the network is made up of cells, behaves in ways that are determined by the cells. So there's not a clean separation. So the story starts as fairy tales must with demonic possession. Uh, the film The Exorcist came out a number of years ago, and it depicts what is now thought to almost certainly be a case of NMDA receptor antibody disease. The film, of course, was highly fictionalized, but it was based on a true story that child was a boy rather than a girl. The uh, key findings which are depicted in the movie are severe dystonia, twisting, not to the point of being able to turn your head all the way around, but almost, and um, psychosis, which is the point that interests us and where we have this intersection between schizophrenia and uh, this 
particular NMDA disease, as well as with ketamine, which is a drug that blocks NMDA and NMDA antagonists. The NMDA antibodies block um, the NMDA. Uh, the psychosis being very prominent in this disorder and autonomic dysfunction, which was also seen in that child has been documented in many cases since then. Also of importance clinically is that these kids, often kids, well, sometimes kids, sometimes pregnant women, women more than men, get better. So whether you have a priest or two priests or no priest at all, they generally get better. And so there is a, a happy ending to the exorcist. So we are looking at a very simple, in this case, hippocampal CA3, cornuomonas area three model. And we've done modeling uh, over many years, over a decade now, working uh, first with Maja Lazarowicz, who was uh, originally trained with Lee Finkel, who uh, unfortunately died, uh, Samini Moten, and Mohammed Sharif. And so here from our paper is this simple model that we'll be presenting. The main feature here is the, uh, the pyramidal cells here on the right, and also uh, basket cells, inhibitory cells, primal cells or excitatory cells, orions, lacanosa, molecular cells, OLM cells, easier to say OLM, projecting to the dendrites of primal cells, basket cells project to the soma, basket cells also project to themselves. This is a circuit of 1200 cells, so when I show it projecting itself, it's not projecting to it's not a single cell projecting itself, it's a population projecting to that population connections between the inhibitory cells, all driven with a theta input from the medial septum, although we demonstrated that that's not necessary for the action of this network. So the network works without any external input uh, once it's activated to, to is sufficiently to, to, to go. Um, so we now are interested in what does this network do? And we find, as many have found both in this type of network and in cortical networks, that the classically defined EEG oscillations, such as theta, which in the human would be four to eight, uh, in the mouse it would be faster, uh, and gamma, which is low gamma and high gamma, but let's say around 40 hertz is kind of classic gamma. These emerge from the network based on the connectivity and based on the time constants and complex interactions of multiple ion channels in the individual cells. And notice that these individual cells are not integrated fire cells. They have complexity bestowed on them by a number of potassium channels, calcium channels, the fast sodium, which allows for spiking, as well as, importantly, the anomalous rectifier, or IH, uh, which comes from the HCN gene. So here we see emergence. We're looking here on the x-axis at time. We have a raster plot on the bottom, which shows the spiking of individual cells, the pyramidal cells in red, basket cells in green, OLM cells in blue. We can generate a simulated LFP, local field potential, here at the top. We have the scale bar here. And uh, we see in the spectrogram here across different frequencies that we have a peak at theta and a smaller, broader peak at gamma. So we now identify the type of dynamics that are occurring, and these have been well characterized by Nancy Capel, Roger Traub, and their colleagues, and these include what's called PING, pyramidal interneuron network gamma, and what's called ING, interneuron network gamma. So here at the bottom is the, uh, the interneuron network of basket cells causing a gamma without respect to the pyramidal cells, and here at the top is the PING. Uh, again, producing a gamma, but using both the primal cells and the interneurons to do it. We now jump back to schizophrenia, again, we're to keep trying to involve our understanding of the omics, the clinical semiology, and the multi-scale modeling, and in this case, we're dealing with the Genomics and a very prominent, important paper published in Nature 2011 showed 
a number of SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, identifying the variome of schizophrenia across many, many patients. And that's one of the difficulties with this, the many, many patients undoubtedly include many subtypes of schizophrenia. In any case, the usual suspect came up, the usual suspect, uh, the NMDA, came up in the form of a single nucleotide polymorphism that is near to the GRIN2A specific type of NMDA receptor. Uh, also implicated was GABA and HCN in looking at SNPs that were near uh, particular genes that are known have a known product. Of course, many of the SNPs are not near anything with a known product or maybe in non-coding regions. That's something we don't deal with. We clearly do not deal with 108 of them uh, that were identified. We're dealing with these three. Just looking at the NMDA, we can then use our results to make a prediction, and that is a prediction that the GRIN2A transcript would be reduced specifically in the Oriens lacanosum moleculare OLM cells. And so here we're looking at the effects of NMDA blockade in our simulation on either OML cells or basket cells or pyramidal cells. And what we find is uniquely when you block the OLM cells, uh, here we see a raster plot on the right, raster at the top, LFP at the bottom, local field potential, different types of cells again, uh, pyramidal cells, basket cells, OML cells. When we do this blockage at this specific site and not other sites, we get this great increase in gamma frequency, reduction in theta frequency. And that was the signature we were looking at based on ketamine model, animal model of schizophrenia, of, of psychosis, really, not of schizophrenia, of, of psychosis. And so here we see theta change, theta down, gamma up with OLM, different patterns with basket or parallel, different patterns with combinations of locations. So this enables us to make a transcripto transcriptomic prediction based on our multiscale modeling understanding of dynamics and based on what had been shown in genome-wide association study genomics of schizophrenia. Now we go on to think about a somewhat more complex model incorporating these other two locations. Uh, this model was relatively recently published in NPJ Schizophrenia. Uh, we now incorporate not only the NMDA changes, and we here have a lot more types of parameters, such as sodium channel density, delayed rectifier density, than we're illustrating, but we're just demonstrating where we're making changes. The place we make changes are NMDA in various locations, but now again focused based on our earlier finding on the OLM site, as well as GABA-A changes and IH changes. And what we're interested in now is really jumping from what we've been looking at at the scale of molecules in the sense that we are talking about blockade of specific receptors, which are molecules, uh, the NMDA, the scale of cells in that we're actively generating models that incorporate the details of cellular uh, ion channels in the dendrites, in the uh, soma, uh, and look at uh, how the dynamics occur through that interaction as well as through the interaction of the network and produce the local field potential, which is up here in the whole hippocampus, let's say, although really we're looking at CA3. Now we want to make this jump from these levels all the way up to what we can understand of cognition and behavior, which is, of course, the dramatic alteration and the life-altering, life-destroying, in some cases, alteration seen in schizophrenia, the paranoia or hallucinations, dissociations, lack of ability to think. Uh, nowadays, the cognitive core is thought to be the primary anomaly of schizophrenia that leads to positive, what's called positive and negative symptoms. 
So how are we going to do that? We're going to turn to information theory. And we have used a tool called Normalized Transfer Entropy, abbreviated NTE, to identify information flow through. And this is a simple model uh, of just excitatory cells in red, inhibitory cells in blue. These are integrated fire cells. They're not uh, detailed realistic cells in any way, but we just wanted to use this to demonstrate that we can have from this left hemisphere, as it were, to this right hemisphere, projections in one direction only, and as, as little as, let's say, 2% of projection density, fairly small projection density, we can start to clearly identify which direction the projection is going using information theory. And many people will not need to be reminded, but I will remind that information theory is based on statistical analysis. And so you say, what is the pro probability at some level, uh, or in this case, a, a transfer entropy, normalized transfer entropy, that there is information flow from this what place to this place. So if we have low enough density, uh, just above 0%, uh, density of connections in one direction, we can't say, are we going one way or are we going the other? The blue here is the same as the red. Uh, left to right is the same as right to left. Uh, apologies for using the same colors. The colors here don't really apply to the colors on the right here. So uh, once we get up to there's 2%, we can clearly identify it. So we can use this tool. We go back to our CA3 network, and we do use this tool to identify the normalized transfer entropy in the case of our modified model with either NMDA alterations, GABA-A alterations, or IH alterations. Uh, and uh, we pick out, in this case, four different points with different degrees of alterations, different degrees of what we would regard as simulated schizophrenia pathology, pathophysiology in this CA3 network. And we find that at a, in a case where the oscillatory strength is overall very low, and so here the oscillatory strength is on the y-axis, and this L1 is just a label referring to this case, we have very little power in oscillation, and we also have very little information flow. When we go to another extreme where we have a very high, very strict oscillatory control of the network, and the network here in the rasterplot is primarily the, going to be the pyramidal cells, that's the largest population, 800 of the 1,200 cells. We have very high power of oscillation, and again, very low information flow here shown in red, comparable to what we saw there. It's only in the intermediate cases, shown here as H1 and H2, where with intermediate level of oscillatory strength, shown here in the black histogram bars, we have the higher amount of information flow from the input to the network to the output to the network. So we hypothesize that there are a set of controls through the different aspects of neural dynamics, both cellular, which would be the HCN or IH, is purely a cellular phenomenon, an ion channel, voltage sensitive ion channel, and synaptic, NMDA, and GABA-A, that are controlling these aspects together, the aspect of oscillatory strength and the aspect of information flow through. And this is a point I want to emphasize. Often we look at these neural networks and we look at actual recordings from classically Eugle and Weasel from cats or from macaques nowadays or mice and rats, and we say the cell is firing a lot, therefore there's a lot of information and we would postulate, at least in the system, that that's not the case. So here, firing rate in the left panel on the x-axis and tra normalized transfer entropy or information flow in the y-axis, uh, demonstrating that very fast-firing cells do not 
transmit a lot of information. And in fact, when you have all the cells firing fast, you just can't distinguish much between them. Of course, this is there's a lot of discussion that, that could be added here, but uh, the general observation is too fast or too slow, no information or very little information flow. It's the sweet spot in between where you have the variability of firing where you can get information flow through. And the this correlates very closely with the population synchrony here shown in the right panel. X-axis is population synchrony, Y-axis again, normalized transfer entropy, where the color coding shows that the same cells here and here. Also, again, this notion of a sweet spot where you have intermediate oscillatory strength where you have a dramatic fall off when you have too much synchrony and a fall off generally, although there's exceptions, uh, when you have too little synchrony. So both rate and oscillation are important indicators, and I would regard both of them as epiphenomena, really. These are what we can measure as indicators of what the coding is that's going on in the system, which is complex, multiplexed, and uh, across many modalities, as it were, the neurotransmitters of different time constants, uh, we have these epiphenomenal indicators that tell us the coding is going on. And, and it really, to our way of thinking, it is not really, it's not really suited to just thinking about it in terms of rate. We really need to think about this oscillatory strength and temporal coding in, in this context as well. Just to say that we've uh, explored NTE as well as oscillatory strength as well as rate in the higher dimensions of uh, looking at these NMDA antagonism parameters, IH parameters, and GABA-A parameters. So here, as we go across the various panels, we are changing, I have to read this, GABA A scaling is, um, uh, being changed across the panels. And on the x-axis, we are changing NMDA receptor scaling, and on the y-axis, the uh, IH or HCN scaling. And so we find that at certain locations in this three-dimensional parameter space, we have these H's, which are the ones I showed before, the H1 and H2, which have extremely high, relatively high information flow, as well as locations here, L1 with very low uh, oscillation and low information flow, and L2 with actually what turns out to be high oscillation. You can't see that here, but you can see that there's low information flow. So we explore this parameter space to see what the dynamics are, to see what the information flow is, and to think about how these various influences to the cell and to the network influence function uh, in the sense of uh, that information can be regarded as a bit of a proxy for cognition. Uh, we want to use that to move on to thinking about drug cocktails, where we're not just using a single drug, but using multiple drugs to control a disease that, that's as complex as this is. And in fact, drug cocktails typically are used empirically. Multiple therapies are used empirically for treating schizophrenia and for treating many other diseases, including epilepsy, Parkinson's disease, and others. Uh, we have made much more complex models than what's shown here. And this is here uh, just an illustration of a cortical model, uh, but illustrating here on the right that we include a lot of the molecular mechanisms in our model, including calcium, which comes out of the endoplasmic reticulum, as well as in from the outside, and including cyclic AMP, including uh, a very preliminary model of G proteins to get the complexity to look at how drugs might act and how they might act at the molecular level up to the cellular, subcellular level, to the cellular level, to the network level. Again, omics and scales of organization and clinical semiology of levels of signs and symptoms. Just to mention very briefly, we're also very much involved in the critical credible practice of modeling and simulation CPMS initiative of the interagency modeling analysis group, multi-scale modeling initiative 
uh, led by Grace Peng, uh, who's an author in one of these papers, and we've published a number of papers with rules, loose rules still, but we're trying to get to a point where modeling and simulation, both in biomedicine research and in healthcare, is sufficiently organized and uh, that it could be regulated by the Food and Drug Administration to be involved in devices developed, involved in, for example, stimulation devices for uh, Parkinson's disease where, where the model could be part of that, the simulation could be part of that. So we have here a, a publication specific to neuroscience as well as here a broader publication with the 10 rules uh, from a multidisciplinary perspective, including people working in orthopedics, working in wound healing, working in multiple areas. <clears throat> and uh, here a third paper, which is more just general philosophy of simulation and modeling as applied to biological phenomena. So uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me and uh, look forward to discussing as we have our discussion groups later.